would like to introduce Dr. Ronald Stram. He's our first speaker of this afternoon. And he, Dr. Stram is the director and founder of the Stram Center for Integrative Medicine in Del Mar, New York. He has 28 years of experience in emergency medicine. He's a member of the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society, the Society for Integrative Oncology, and the America College of Emergency Physicians. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Ronald Stram. So is this the entertainment section? <laughs> wait, wait, it's a long phone call. Um, so welcome everyone, and I hope to at least inform you, if not entertain you. Um, so a global approach, the reason why I speak about a global approach is because this is not just a local problem, this is a national problem, and it is an international problem. And so really what we need is an international answers. And um, and so I'm hoping that you'll get some good information from this program. So what we want to do is really provide you information. I think you've gotten some information from the, the early morning sessions about how to support yourself, how to prevent tick bites, what to do, and also for physicians and healthcare providers because this is a very confusing disease and unfortunately, much of the information that I actually gave out when I was a uh, resident, a first year resident, uh, uh, emergency medicine resident, back in 1992, I was giving a Lyme disease talk, and uh, it was pretty much the same information that you're given now if you're a healthy provider, which is, which is, it's easy to diagnose, it's easy to treat, and uh, you'll be fine, and that's kind of and that's really what I was told back then, and often I hear the same now. Uh, unfortunately, Lyme disease and tick-borne illnesses are a blind spot in many practitioners' eyes, and it's truly unfortunate. I'm gonna give you a number of patient stories. Some of them will be on the slide. Some of them have been prompted by some of the information I got today, so that I'll kind of hopefully give you some information that uh, will help with any of you identify it and then really looking at the symptoms and the treatment. So first off, who am I? I, I trained in medical school in New York City, did a couple years of general surgery before I saw the light in emergency medicine, and I trained at Albany Medical Center in emergency medicine, and uh, practiced emergency medicine for a number of years, over 25 years. During that time, I had witnessed what we do well in medicine. And I believe what we do well in medicine is we do acute care really well. So if you've had a heart attack or a stroke, uh, or if you have a major accident and you need an orthopedic surgeon and they can figure out how to put you back together, we do that really well. What we don't do that well is chronic conditions. And chronic conditions, the pill for every ill doesn't always work. And because of that, and because of what I saw as this revolving door in emergency departments, since emergency departments are not just like what you see on TV, really 90% of the time you're seeing acute exacerbations of chronic illnesses, and it's the other 10% that all of us ER docs love, which is the acute care stuff. But I really felt that I was limited in my ability to treat and to really understand, and that's why I did a integrative medicine fellowship through the University of Arizona. And it was there that I really saw a bigger, broader rush for looking at the causal relationship for diseases and then the approach to treatments, which are not always the pill for an ill or the device that fits. So back in 2002, shortly after I completed uh, my fellowship, I opened up the uh, Stram Center for Integrated Medicine, and we really started out as a practice looking at causal relationships for disease. Lo and behold, we then, after about a few years, kept on seeing a number of confusing illnesses that were either not diagnosed or were diagnosed at some point, and we thought that maybe some other treatment could be beneficial. Be it in tick-borne illnesses, or irritable bowel problems, or even 
chronic issues like high blood pressure, or heart disease, or diabetes, which we again felt that there are other ways to treat. And uh, it was exciting to really do this. So this disease brings you down. And uh, it's really challenging. And it really can challenge the core of your being. Resilience is the ability to bounce back after something really affects your core. And what I like to tell people is the bubbles on the top, lifestyle and spirit, that's what lifts you up. Because the other stuff is actually what brings you down. And what we really see as significantly important is food is medicine or it's your slowest poison. And unfortunately, it's not often uh, recognized as a treatment or as a prescription that is very effective for chronic conditions. Movement. If you move, blood circulates, and it gets the stuff that you want out and the stuff that you want penetrated further in, in. And we will talk about some of the different dietary lifestyles, such as uh, veganism, vegetarianism, paleo diet, ketogenic diet, and we'll talk about that. But I also want to talk very specifically about spirit and how you keep yourself up while you're feeling so down. And I will tell you that the support and the love that you can either put out or give back is very important. As was stated by a pretty famous actress, um, God gave us two hands. One is to help ourselves and the other is to help others. And I think if you do that, that's, uh, that's part of this mission. And that's part of the mission that I believe I am fortunate enough in medicine to be, be able to do something that I feel has great meaning and purpose for people that really have not a lot of other options. Who said that? Audrey Hepburn. So, um, prayer, you know, whatever works, meditation, religion, volunteer at your hospitals, at your churches, just get out there. Because the other stuff is what brings you down. Right? It's the microbiology, it's your micropathology, it's what's your genetic predisposition. And we will find out, and hopefully you'll hear, the microbiology is not typically a uniform bug, it typically is many different bugs, and it needs to be treated as such. The biological terrain is looking at what your what what your levels of your vitamins, your minerals. Um, again, what's your genetic predispositions? And those we believe are very important in figuring out how best to care for you. So we will look at your thyroid levels. We will look at your interleukin levels. We will look at your immunoglobulin levels. We will look at your food allergy panels. We will look at your stool testing to see what your microbiome looks at because all these really are significant in the treatment aspect, but really that's where the resilience comes up. So patient stories are important because they can kind of give you an indication of what is going on sometimes. So first is, uh, this is a young guy, he's a, I met him when he wasn't feeling so well, but at, you know, six or seven years old, he, he loved to play soccer, and he loved to play football, and the other football, which is American football. And, uh, and he was doing great. He was actually motivated. He always wanted to be out there in the fields and play. And then all of a sudden, he started to get uh, joint pain. And this joint pain was migratory joint pain, meaning it would go from his knee, and then to his shoulder, and then to his wrist. And sometimes his knee would blow up. And unfortunately, because of the blind sight of tick-borne illnesses, uh, this young man was uh, sent to a number of different providers, and this is not uncommon in our practice. Uh, I think uh, our record is 45 physicians until uh, they see someone like me. I think Rich has 100, so that's a, uh, he, he's always looking to win, but I, I don't want to look at that. Uh, but 
he saw several rheumatologists and they basically diagnosed him with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, non-laboratory testing. So his tests were all negative, which is interesting because you can make a clinical diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, but you can't make a clinical diagnosis of Lyme disease. So I will tell you that that's really kind of not fair. It's not fair to the public. I mean, give it some credit, you know. But he was diagnosed with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. He was put on major medications such as methotrexate. He was finally put on Humira. Uh, which in long-term studies shows that it can increase lymphoma, it increases infections. And he was on that drug for a year at seven years old. No improvement. He gained about 50 pounds. Uh, he was debilitated. He was on narcotics as a eight-year-old. Um, so the mother, because typically, you know, Moms know their kids. And in fact, interesting study done out of the Mayo Clinic looked at moms, pediatricians, and ER docs. <laughs> and I, you know, I thought it was kind of unfair, because the ER docs, they should be up there. They should, you know, they should be ER docs, moms, then pediatricians. No, but, but anyway, so, um, so they looked at the study, and the study was, they, they were given 200 patients to review, and they didn't have to make a diagnosis, they just had to say sick versus not sick. Who do you think won? So moms won 95% of their <coughs> Pediatricians about 70, and the ER docs about 60. So, so, you know, so when I, when I read this study, and I was a, a resident reading this study, I decided that, you know what? If the mom thinks the child's sick, they're sick. And just try to figure it out. Anyway, the mom told the primary care doctor, can you please test my son for Lyme disease? Because he hasn't been tested. So a year later, he was tested. He tested 10 out of 10 positive bears. So he just kind of hit the jackpot. Um, so unfortunately, he had not been treated for over a year have been treated with immunosuppressive drugs. And he was very, very sick. He was also on narcotics. He wasn't moving. No one talked to him about his diet. And um, anyway, but, but they gave him doxycycline for four weeks. You're cured. <laughs> and he wasn't. He still had the pain. So the infectious disease doc took over. And he gave him a single dose of ceftriaxone, in which he had an anaphylactic reaction, required intubation, and uh, almost died. So the, rheumatologist, the uh, infectious disease doctor uh, said, well, he doesn't have Lyme disease anymore because he already got the doxycycline, and there's no other treatment. So that's when we saw uh, this young man. and. Fortunately, we did treat him, and we treated him with multiple different drugs because he was not only uh, Lyme positive, but he was Babesia and Bartonella. And so you have to treat Lyme differently. Uh, as we will talk about, uh, Lyme is a stealth infection. Uh, like Bob said, it doesn't grow like other bugs. <coughs> other bugs tend to grow fast, rapid. Uh, strep infection. People have had strep infections, right? The first day you get a strep throat, ah, your throat hurts a little bit. The next day it feels like you're swallowing you know, razor blades. Lyme isn't like that. Lyme, it, it's, it's a stealth bug. It doesn't want to hang around your body. It likes to get out. And it likes to get out fast. So it tends to hide in tissues. Because of that, the symptoms are very indolent. They occur very slowly, so the ability to get an acute sort of picture of what it looks like clinically is very difficult. So the, this is the story of Ty, and I'm going to give you another story only because of what I heard. Um, so this is a story that, you know, interesting case. This is a baseball player, and he's 15 years old, and he was really a good baby. This isn't this story. Because I'm actually giving you this story because this is a story of someone who lives very close to here. Uh, 
over the Pennsylvania border, uh, very close to here, in a very epidemic, endemic area of tick-borne illnesses. And this young man, 15 years old, uh, when he was 14, developed acute chest pain, shortness of breath, and night sweats, fever. And they took him to the hospital, they took him to the ER, and they noticed that he had super elevated cardiac enzymes. And that they checked his, his echocardiogram to look at what his heart looks like, and he developed an acute myocarditis. His ability to pump with his heart dropped down to half. So this is a baseball player that now was so debilitated he couldn't get out of bed without having chest pain and shortness of breath. So the parents, who were very well resourced, did what anyone would do that knew that their child, because right, moms, Parents like my mom used to say, you're only as happy as your least happiest child. Mm -hmm. You bring them to the best place. And as you may know, what's the best place to do hearts? Cleveland Clinic, right? So Cleveland Clinic, you know, they should know everything. They should really, they should just figure it out. And here it is, 15-year-old kid, who gets myocarditis as a 15-year-old that's not a drug abuser, that's not doing some weird stuff? Um, or it doesn't have some genetically predisposition cardiac abnormality, who gets that without thinking that it could be tick-borne illnesses? Well, they didn't. So they really, all they did was they treated them as an inflammatory condition, and they gave them sort of anti-inflammatories, including steroids, um, and uh, you know certain common anti-inflammatory drugs. They waited it out. And over the course of about six months, he improved. Um, his cardiac enzymes reverted, his, his ejection fraction improved, and he improved. But they came to see me and they said, you know, we're worried about this. And I said, what happened during that time that you brought him in? Because it was during sort of January. Because, well, actually, he got the flu and then developed this infection. And so very interesting, uh, and very interesting research that was actually done by Nicole Baumgart out of uh, the University of California. And there's a number of really interesting research going on using animal models. And this animal model looked at the mice model. And the mice model that she used was to look at the effect of Borrelia infections on the immune complexes, on the immune centers. And what she found was that if you gave these mice inoculation of Lyme disease, their immune response was muted. And in fact, if you gave them Lyme disease and you gave them an antibiotic, their antibodies dropped. So single dose doxycycline for an initial bite could reduce your likelihood of developing positive infection, positive lab test. In this case, so in this case, what they found is that they also gave these mice influenza. And the response to influenza was muted so that they maintained illness for a much longer period of time and they did not develop antibodies, which is what we see clinically. And in this young man, my belief was he had the flu, the flu exacerbated his Lyme, and his Lyme was located in his heart. And so what we did is he actually, I said, look, let's just treat him without any kind of antibiotics, and we'll go through sort of foods and exercise and just trying to really improve his immune system. And just let's see if he starts getting the flu, we'll treat the flu, whether it's with some antiviral, and then if he starts getting chest pain or elevates his enzymes, we're going to hit him with IV antibiotics. And that's what we did. We tested him. He tested positive or not. Now, Cleveland Clinic, you should be ashamed of yourself. Because 
that's ridiculous. This is, this is something that should be thought of anyone that comes in with kind of crazy rhythm disorders, um, chest pain in a young person, think Lyme disease and too it otherwise. So this is just to give you an idea that we see people from all over the world. This young lady was from New Zealand. She was a middle school teacher. And the problem is, is that people travel. And I don't know if they have it in New Zealand. They do. But, but she actually traveled to Europe. And she traveled to the Black Forest and places in Europe that are also endemic for Lyme. And she came to see us because, you know, again, she was told that she's crazy and that it's in her head. And I said, yes, it is in your head, but you're not crazy. Um, and she couldn't remember. She loved teaching. She couldn't work. She had severe chest pain, musculoskeletal pain, headaches, memory loss, abdominal pain of unknown etiology, worked up like everybody with, you name it, every CT, MRI, uh, scoped in and out, all negative. And when we began treatment, uh, she became 95% better. Now, unfortunately, she relapsed. And like Bob said, we don't know if people relapse or they get reinfected. Because unfortunately, we live in an area that your exposure is super high. And just like you heard, nymphs you can't see. And if you could see, um, you know, and if you could see them, you don't feel them because the tick injects a little anesthetic. So you don't even know if you're getting bit. And actually, the, the, the people that recall being bit is less than 50%. It's actually more like less than 20%. And so therefore, you really don't know if it's a relapse or a reinfection. And so she came back to see us. We retreated her. And she became 85% you know, to 90% there. So if that's not enough to freak you out, this is what we look at. Um, and uh, cast it around, just pass it around, just see what you got. Um, but basically, the reason why I show you this is because it is a very complicated disease. And one size does not fit all. And you have to look at the whole picture, I do believe, that the only way to treat this disease, this infection, is holistic. I will tell you that. I, I believe, actually, obviously, I believe that's the only way to treat diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, uh, irritable bowel problems, you name it. I'll tell you, treat it holistically, people will get better, faster, and with less uh, medications. But what we're going to do is I'm going to go over this sort of piece by piece. But this is an idea of what we really look at. And as you see, we have algorithms. So if you're zero percent better, maybe we're barking up the wrong tree. Remember, for physicians, maintain a differential diagnosis. Just continue to maintain it. Keep Lyme in your differential diagnosis. You have a population that has an endemic probability. You can't rule it out. The current testing does not allow you to rule it out. And in fact, the CDC says you can't rule it out. So if you say you're ruling it out, you're either willfully misinformed or you're speaking false facts. So any physician that says to you, I've ruled it out, you tell them that they're globally misinformed. Now, in fact, Maryland and Virginia, um, they have actually a law against a physician telling you that. Uh, pretty interesting, because we don't have it in New York, because that's not a problem here, right? No, it is a problem. And the reason why it was happened in Virginia is because Lyme was so endemic that the housing prices started to drop. So people were kind of pissed. So they went to their congressional leaders, and they said, listen, I'm going to vote you out unless you do this. So in 2013, that law was passed, and then actually 2015, the law in Maryland came for the suit. But just look it up, Lyme Law, Maryland, you'll see it, it's in there. It says specifically the Lyme disease diagnosis is problematic. 
It can be either false negative or false positive. We believe that it's really very unusual it's false negative, but it's highly usual it's false. Uh, very unusual that it's false positive, highly usual that it's false negative. All right, so I think because we're in the southern tier, I figured it'd be great to have like Lyman tiers. I don't know, you could have southern, we could have first tier, second tier, you know, northern tier. Um, unfortunately, like we spoke about, this is all not true. Because symptoms don't typically appear within two months, two weeks. This is what you're told. They don't have to. So we said it's a stealth infection. Meaning it gets into your bloodstream and the first thing it likes to do is, like Bob showed you, it likes to screw itself out of the system and go into the tissue. That's what it likes to do. So because it does that, your symptoms can be very vague. They don't have to be migratory joint pain. They don't have to be a headache. They could be, like I said, you're just having stomach pain. You're just having foot pain. I just don't feel right. I feel fatigued. It could be now, or it could be three, four, six months later. Because since it grows, unlike a strep infection or E. coli, which doubles in its population every five to ten minutes, imagine it, five to ten minutes, you're doubling its population. You know, you got a hundred thousand bugs within, you know, eight hours. If this doubles every 12, 24, sometimes as slow as 48 hours, you could have symptoms that don't start occurring until weeks, months later, or when you get that flu vaccine, or HPV vaccine, or you happen to get the flu, or you get gastroenteritis, because it's immune suppressant. It hangs out in your lymph tissues. So yes, can you get lymphoproliferation that looks like lymphoma? Yes, you can. But now, the thought is after three months of infection, you get fatigue, cognitive dysfunction, memory loss, and in the later stages are neurological symptoms and pops. And I will tell you that that's the textbook, and the textbook isn't true. From my clinical experience, People have varying experience. You know, we've seen thousands of patients already. Um, their, their symptoms are all across the board. And that's why this looks like this. So Dr. Horowitz has his, his questionnaire. It's pretty uh, intense. It gives me a uh, heartburn when I even look at it. But, uh, um, but, but here you see, you name a symptom, and I'll tell you, yes, I've seen it. You, any symptom, anything, any, you know. I got bruising, yeah, yeah, that could be. I got Raynaud's syndrome, which I've never had before. Yeah, yeah, I've seen it. I got the dark circles under my eyes, and then, you know, I'm so fatigued, yeah, yeah, I've seen that. So this is the problem. This is the problem with clinical diagnosis, is because clinically, it now surpasses the other great mutator, which was another spirochete called syphilis, right? So syphilis left untreated, which was done in the U.S. by the Tuskegee experiments, right? Kind of not a nice thing to do. Let's say one half I'm going to treat, the other half I'm not. We'll see what happens. Hey, those are, we'll see what happens. Good luck to you. And unfortunately, some of those people developed a lot of the symptoms that we see with untreated Lyme disease. Carditis, neurological symptoms, skin problems, joint problems. Um, the difference is that syphilis is really pretty easy to treat. It's a relatively uncomplicated bug. It doesn't have anywhere ne near the genomic sequences that that really does. So what to look for? Again, really confusing. What I'll tell you is to go by, if you're a physician, it's history, history, and history. And history, for the most part, will give you the answer 85% of the time. And this is not me telling you a number. This is a number that was looked at 
60, 70 years ago when they said they didn't have all the diagnostic studies that they have now. They repeated the same concept of just history getting to the diagnosis. So another kind of interesting study that was done, um, and I believe this one was out of the Cleveland Clinic. In the Cleveland Clinic, the, it was an ER doc study. And it was a doc study that they gave the doc the ability to speak to someone for five minutes. Just get an intake for five minutes. That was it. No physical exam, no vital signs. Just to talk to them for five minutes. Or, on the other side, they were given an hour to talk to them. They had access to every information they needed, lab testing, CTs, you name it. The ability to form a differential diagnosis was 74% for the five minute and 78% for the hour. So what I'll tell you is that intuition, the gut, what you think if someone's sick, it's the mom response. If you care about your patients, if you don't let your ego get in the way, you will come up with a diagnosis. Unexplained tachycardia. We see this very commonly in young people. It's much more common in young people. Uh, unexplained tachycardia, typically they also have symptoms of POTS. POTS, if you don't know, is postural orthostatic tachycardia, which is when you lay down, your heart rate's in the 70, and you stand up, and it's 130. And you feel like your heart's jumping out of its chest. It's very uncomfortable, and oftentimes that can also result with lowering the blood pressure. Low or mildly high temperature elevation, do you see that? Just like Bob was saying, that you can see it in mid-afternoon with elevated temperatures. Musculoskeletal joint pain, again, migratory joint pain, nothing does that except some of the other uh, infectious diseases. Gonorrhea will do that. That's pretty uncommon. Again, easy, easy to treat in gonorrhea. But if you have migratory joint pain, you've got Lyme disease to a proven otherwise. And I'd say if they're trying to prove it otherwise, they're probably wrong. Occipital tenderness, very common, right in the back here. This is the most common area that people get tenderness. And then this vague abdominal tenderness, um, nondescript. Sometimes it's localized, depending on what the bug it is. More common when we see it with Bartonella, that people get pelvic type pain. And then uh, the labs. And I'll just tell you that labs, what we do is we just do a whole bunch. And I'll tell you that we, we use Igenix, but we use all other labs, because I will tell you that sometimes Igenix is negative and others are positive. It just, it's, it's really tough, because the testing is so poor. And it's across the board, because what I told you is that it's, it's an indirect method of testing. And even T-cell response testing, we have seen limited <coughs> effectiveness. And again, that's because I'm the doc looking at it, and I say, you know what, you're really sick, your T-cell response is negative, I'm sorry, you still have Lyme disease, or you have something. We look at vitamin levels, B12, B6, D, but we also will look at your immunological patterns, because if your IgG is low and you're immunosuppressed, it may be that no matter what I give you, you're not going to get better, because you need your IgG to form a good, positive immunological response. So common lab results is that we typically do see a low white blood cell count. Otherwise, it's often normal. Sometimes you'll see elevations in inflammatory markers, like SED rate, HSCRP, C-reactive protein. The interleukins you can sometimes see more often than some of the inflammatory markers, and people go, wait, I feel so inflamed. How could I not have a high level of C-reactive or separate. My doc says, I don't have rheumatoid arthritis, but I certainly feel like it. It does weird stuff. It creates immunological problems where maybe there are immunological complexes that then cause an inflammatory response that's not picked up by those tests. So, it's a clinical diagnosis. We don't have accurate testing. And 
you know, if it was HIV and you would say you've got a 60% chance of us getting it right, no one would accept it. It is not 60%. It's less than that. So, interesting study. Again, these are, these are my heroes, and I'm going to tell you that. Uh, you know, uh, Monica Embers out of Tulane University, um, she's a remarkable researcher. So she's done non-human primate studies, looking at tick-borne disease, looking at Lyme disease specifically. And this is a fantastic study, and one that if you bring it to your doctors who tells you there is no such thing as persistent Lyme, say, well, then tell the monkeys that. <laughs> so what she did is a very interesting test. She inoculated the monkeys, so they were all inoculated. You know you got it. She took 10 monkeys, inoculated 10 of them. So first she waited three months to get tested. One of the monkeys had absolutely no antibodies. None. None were found. The monkeys that tested positive, in other words, they would consider CDC positive, three out of 10. Now, these are 100% infected. Three out of 10. You're looking at 30% positive. Out of those monkeys, they then, after three months, they were done, they were given what typically would happen in a clinical setting. Right, doc, I'm not feeling good. Um, I got joint pain, I got migratory symptoms, I got my head feels weird, I'm fatigued. All right. And you tell the doctor, can you please test me? Because they, you know, they may not think it, right? So they test it. So now you test negative, but you say, look, I know I have it. I think, please. So they'll give you a month of doxycycline. And that's what was done with these monkeys. And let me also give you that out of the bullseye rash. So these monkeys, these are Macau monkeys, they are very similar in terms of their response to Lyme disease as humans. Bullseye rash. One month. So, hey, wait, that's my clinical diagnosis. Well, that's not going to work much. Cognitive problems in at least 20% of them. And we'll find out why. So, you know, so here they gave them a month. You're good. You're, you're cured, right? That's, that was, that's, the, that's the verbiage, right? You're cured. Well, her research, what she did was then she tested. So she tested everything. She tested their blood, she tested their tissues, and so she tested their blood after a month after being on doxycycline. And she found active spirochetes in the blood. Now, what she did is she left the monkeys after being treated for a year. And now she did autopsies. She looked at their brains, their hearts, their tissues. Two of the monkeys had active spirochetes in the brain. One of them had active spirochetes in the heart. And the rest of them had either tissue specific in the muscles, in the joints, and in the connective tissue. One month of treatment, you're sure. You're not. Single drug therapy does not work. This is similar. This is similar. This is not an unusual concept infectious disease. This is similar to other persistent infections. Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is a stealth infection. It doesn't act like a normal pneumonia. Normal pneumonias, they like to go where there's not a lot of oxygen and there's a high amount of, uh, not a lot of oxygen and there's a low amount of blood flow. They tend to go down to lower areas of the not so with tuberculosis. It likes to go into the upper lungs, where there's a lot of oxygen and a lot of blood flow. Very difficult to grow in culture. And when it was understood that this was mycoplasma tuberculi, they tried with a single drug treatment. So what happened? People actually got better for about two weeks. And they relapsed. So they tried two drugs. Two drugs wasn't effective. 
Now there's four drugs, because what do those drugs do? They work on active infection, they work on different aspects of the cell wall, the DNA, the protein synthesis, and they work on this concept of persistence. Because what we know is that, and this is again what seems to be found, is that this bug persists. Now, doxycycline, great drug. In fact, it's the most unusual thing. I mean, I, you know, I don't know, I've been in medicine for 30 years. I've never heard of an infectious disease that only has one treat. Doxycycline, that's it. And if you can go for IV, you gross that. So doxycycline has absolutely no effect on persistence. None. No activity. So if that's the only drug you're given, unless there aren't any persistence, you're not going to be feeling well afterwards. So that's a problem, because that's then the only drug that you know. There are other drugs that are actually do have persistence activity. Sulfur drugs like Bactrim. Um, cefuroxine, cefoperazone, those have persistence. And they also have activity against the active growing bacteria. Some of the other uh, antibiotics that Dr. Horowitz will talk about, and I'll talk about a little bit, is daptomycin, pyrazinamide, but those are not benign drugs. I'm going to just tell you. Some other really interesting research is done on essential oils. Dr. Zhang out of, uh, out of Baltimore, out of John Hopkins, another fantastic researcher who's looked at this, looked at essential oils. And we'll talk about that as, as a possible way to get around stuff. So clinical Lyme diagnosis, blood testing, a lot of false negatives, and uh, a lot of people come back and see us that have been either not diagnosed or diagnosed and told that they don't have it. So how do we treat? Um, you know, first off is that we, we really look at you as a whole person and these are some of the general treatments, uh, craniosacral therapy, acupuncture, nutrition, um, and physical activity. We do use herbs as well. Herbs tend to have sometimes a more gentle effect on the system. It tends to be uh, areas where people can, uh, you know, feel better without having to feel sick. Because uh, some of the herbs can really just sort of be effective, but not be uh, that dramatic. But I will tell you that where we start first is the gut. And basically, this is really one of the most important components of how we treat you. So first off is, what does your gut look like? How do you feel? Probiotics are the key. Anyone that's on an antibiotic has to be on probiotics. In fact, we don't really allow antibiotics to be given unless you're on a pretty significant probiotic regimen. And it goes beyond just oral. We may even recommend an enema protocol. And that's because um, your body is like this container. And the water is like all the bugs in the body. So you have about, about one to two trillion cells in your body. You've got about 150 trillion microbes. Those microbes, we believe, really help message how you can be healthy or unhealthy. And some of the studies were done on using mice, again, that are called notobiotic mice. So notobiotic mice are mice that have been raised devoid of any bacteria. So one would think, wow, they, they must be really healthy, right? They got no bugs in them. But one would be wrong. So they are very unhealthy. They have generally a tremulous disorder. They're continuously fidgety. They can't gain any weight. And their bones are very, very fragile. 
So, a study was done looking at them to see what's the real effect of the microbiome on them. So they did a colectomy. So they removed a portion of their um, large intestines. They actually removed the whole large intestines, which is a relatively common operation that's done. I mean, it's, not, it's not a fun thing to happen, but it's done for people that have very severe Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, um, and you may have it removed. And so interesting is when they removed the colon, from these mice that were notobiotic, no bacteria, it should be great, right? Be, wow, no bacteria, it should be perfect. They all die. So, the other part of this was to take the feces from their healthy counterparts, their healthy mice, and give it to them prior to the operation. They gave it to them about a week later, they operated. Same thing. Lived. And in fact, six months or three months later, they opened them up and looked at their intestines, and like what would, what would happen in humans, their small intestines now converted to what looked like large intestines. So what we believe is that signaling using good bacteria is really important. So like Bob was saying, if we just indiscriminately give you antibiotics without understanding the effect on your microbiome, it could have a very significant effect. In fact, we believe that that's probably one of the causes of higher obesity rates in children because of the use of antibiotics, specifically amoxicillin, right? Amoxicillin, very often given for strep throat, ear infection, with young people, one to two years old, when you're starting to grow your microbiome. And it's interesting because you see that the weight problem with those young people is greater if they've been given antibiotics. And what we believe is it's because bugs are neither good or bad. It's all about balance. So, interesting is H. pylori. Anyone know about H. pylori? Oh, my brother does. He had, he just diagnosed. Anyway, so, you know, typically, and I'm gonna just say, because this is HIPAA, but I'm gonna just say, he, he's got it. So I'm just gonna say, he's got it. You know? um, so, you know, and he's gonna be treated with amoxicillin and by accident. Now, little kids that, don't have H. pylori, they actually do. They actually have high amounts of H. pylori when they're growing. And those high amounts of H. pylori are protective. They're protective against recurrence of upper respiratory tract infections. So when you give amoxicillin indiscriminately, you actually increase the likelihood that they're gonna get reinfected. Microbiome, H. pylori, important for some stages in your life, not so important later. The gut protocol, we basically, if you come to see us, we tell you, look, we're not gonna treat you now. We can get your gut ready. This is a chronic infection, it's not a acute infection. Chronic infection typically means we treat your gut first. So it typically is using multiple different strains. We'd look to have you have bifidobacteria, which typically is more of an anti-inflammatory. Lactobacillus species, which it's not lactose, meaning it's, it's not milk born, it's actually, it uses lactic acid to kill its bacteria. And then Saccharomyces boulardii, which is a promycotic. So pro promycotic means it's a good yeast. And very interesting, because Saccharomyces is probably the most important aspect of that, because its, a, it's effect on C. diff, so Clostridia difficile, which is a bad infection to get, right? Bad infection, super bad diarrhea, wasting problem, very hard to treat, a lot of uh, resistance to it. Um, Saccharomyces has about a 75% kill rate. So high doses of Saccharomyces very protective. And, oh, by the way, what's the best cure for C. diff? Fecal transplant. Did you guys eat lunch yet? 
Um, so yeah, so, so, so fecal transplant, the, the rate of success with fecal transplant with people with C. diff infection, one to two treatments. Whereas you could be on antibiotics for weeks or more. So just very interesting, you know, this whole concept of, of, of your gut microbiome is really what we see as one of the biggest and the greatest aspects of medicine. I mean, it's being used, we use it for, uh, for autism, for Parkinson's, for movement disorders, for irritable bowel problems. I'm not talking about Lyme. So what to eat? Well, I can tell you what not to eat. Don't eat processed sugars. Don't eat those wraps. Uh, because basically anything that turns into sugar is not going to be good for you. And if you're eating meat, if it lived in a cage, it's sick. If you were in the wild and you were trying to hunt, you wouldn't be killing the, you know, the, the deer that's going like this. You wouldn't eat it. I mean, unless you're starving, then maybe. But feel, it's in a cage, it's giving antibiotics, right? It's giving antibiotics. People think it's giving antibiotics so that it could, you know, get rid of the infection. It's actually giving antibiotics to change your microbiome so that you become inefficient at digesting your food, so it makes you fatter. We used to bring cows to slaughter after about four years. Now we bring them to slaughter about a year and a half, because they're about the same weight. So if you look at grass-fed and grass-slaughtered, because you've got to make sure they're grass-slaughtered, because what happens is they can be grass-fed, and then for the last three months of their life, they're grain-fed and candy-fed and everything to gain their weight. So you just have to watch out for that. But if they're grass-fed, they actually have almost the equivalent omega-3 fatty acids that's found in salmon and some of the other uh, small fish. So it's really important. And you know, this is where what we see is ketogenic diet is really a very extreme diet. It is, it is beneficial for some folks. It's not so beneficial for others. Um, these diets, you really have to look at you know, what works for you. Uh, so ketogenic diet, typically, the fat content is 70%, um, which is a lot. Um, typically, the carbohydrate amount is somewhere between 5 and 10%, mm -hmm. and the protein is 20%. You basically need to go into ketosis, and that's what it does is it's very interesting because it really shuts off your insulin production. And by doing that, by shutting off your insulin production, you're not raising blood sugar or things that will lock your fat away to be used for your metabolism. So that has very interesting concepts. We have seen it used with cancer patients, specifically with, with brain cancer patients. Uh, there are some really good studies with it. And in fact, Upstate is actually doing a study with ketogenic diet on glioblastomas, and uh, you know, some interesting work done. The paleo diet basically is the hunter and gatherer diet. It's also pretty restrictive. It doesn't allow you to have legumes, which we think there's some problems with legumes in that they have a high amount of lectins. Lectins are proteins which can inhibit absorption. But otherwise, we don't think legumes are too bad. Um, and then there's the anti-inflammatory diet, which allows certain grains um, and dairy, but we're not big on that. I'm going to say that just because I think that dairy is really a problem. Uh, you know, animals typically do not eat or drink the milk of another animal. It just doesn't happen. And if you're going to eat of a smaller animal, so sheep or goat are probably better. But in terms of our practice, so we do that biological terrain. We will look at probably a food allergy panel like we get it on almost every day. We look at immunoglobulin panels, not IgE alone, because IgE is just a skin test concept. It's just an immediate reaction. IgG is a long-term response. So we'll look at it, and the most common that we see is 
dairy, eggs, sugar, yeast, wheat. It's probably most common. We also have seen now an uptick, no, no pun intended, um, in almonds. And that's because of the great way almonds are um, processed. About three, four years ago, there was a salmonella outbreak with almonds. And so uh, a brilliant idea would be to roast the almonds and kill the bacteria. But it costs money. So a cheaper version would be to use antifreeze. And so antifreeze does the same thing, except what we think is it also causes some kind of immunological reaction people, especially people that, you know, they say, oh, I'm really eating healthy, I'm having my almond milk and my almonds for breakfast and my almonds for lunch, and, and then we see almonds at the highest rate of, uh, of, of immunoglobulins or of, of antigenicity. So just to kind of put this at home, I'm going to tell you another story. So this is John, but John was like a so I'm mean, just going to first preface it. Uh, everyone's young that isn't 25 years old. So John was young. He was about 66. So John was a hunter, and he lived up north by me. So he was a hunter, and he was a restaurateur. His restaurant was a bar and restaurant. He had a pizzeria and burgers. And so you know, when I spoke to John, I said, so John, what do you like to eat? He goes, well, for breakfast, I have donuts. And for lunch, I have beer. And then after lunch, I have some beer, and then I may throw in some pizza, and some chicken wings, and some burgers, and then, you know, maybe at night I'll have some cake, and some cookies, and some garlic nuts, because they're good for you, garlic, it's good. <laughs> I said, great. I said, John, how do you feel? He goes, oh, man, I can't even work in my restaurant, I've got so much fatigue, my joints hurt, I'm cognitively impaired, I mean, he didn't say cut, he said, I can't think straight, and I said, oh, okay, John, uh, so guess what? All that food you're eating, you're not gonna be able to eat it. <laughs> so he looked at me and he literally looked at me and he stood up. He goes, like hell I'm not. <laughs> the good news was his wife was right next to him. Because <laughs> he was six foot six, 300 pounds, and I'm about 160 and not six foot six. And his wife was four foot eleven. She grabbed him by the shirt, and she said, "You're going to listen to the doctor, or I'm going to walk out." I said, "Great, okay." So, so John, I said, "John, we're going to test you. We're going to see what's going on. We're going to test you for everything. We're going to do the Lyme testing, the Bezier test. I'm going to, we're going to test you out the wazoo, right?" And and I'm going to tell you, this is an amazing part of hygienics. Hygienics actually, Medicare patients. They are covered, um, so it is, it is a gift. And so we're able to test using hygienics where people don't have to, you know, have, it's, it's a pretty big price tag. Not that it is a, they, hygienics is a lifesaver for us, I'm gonna say that. Um, but so we tested him using hygienics and uh, we did full panel testing on him. And, um, and I did the gut protocol on him probiotics, gave him some vitamins to figure it out, gave him some stuff to sort of repair his gut. We use zinc, vitamin A, um, we use glutamine, some of the demulsificants, which again, if you want to ask questions, I'm typically pretty good at stump the herb guy or whatever, so you can ask me, but slippery elm, marshmallow, those are all good demulsificants. Uh, DGL licorice, good for the gut as well. Uh, glutamine is really great for repair of the gut. But anyway, we did all this stuff, um, and, he, and he was receptive, and he really was. He was a really nice guy, actually. Um, so, so six weeks later, he comes back to my office. Now, I had already reviewed his tests. He was um, IgM and IgG CDC positive for Lyme. He was positive on Igenics for Babesia and Bartonella, which, you know, is not always that easy. I'm going to tell you that. And he, he like, did a trifecta, that's what we call it, it's a trifecta. Whoa, you got it. So he walks into my office, I check the door, and he ends it, just, Doc, you're a miracle worker. What? I'm 
80 percent ahead of him. His wife said he was able to repair his, his bar for the first time in two years. He's thinking straight. His joint pain is reduced by 80 percent. And he feels really almost back to normal. He's hungry. No, no, he's, he was not hungry. Stop it. Stop it, Joe. Joe, look. You know, hecklers, hecklers we're going we're gonna to point them out. We're going to point them out. Okay? Right there, heckler. Okay? Um, and, you know, so interesting, right? There was, he tested positive, but his symptoms improved. It's to tell you that food is medicine. And you got to start with it. Food is medicine, and it is or your slowest poison. And these are studies that were done looking at gluten and vegan, uh, veganism, or any of the number of foods. I will tell you that bottom line is, um, if you're buying bread and you leave it out for a month and it doesn't go bad, <laughs> Guess what? The bugs don't like it on the outside. Your bugs aren't going to like it either. Don't eat it. Don't even remove it. So uh, these are studies that were done showing and sort of proving this. So now you got all this stuff that you're supposed to take, and how do you walk the tight wire of, of <coughs> treatment versus toxicity? And, you know, and, and I, I don't know. You remember the movie with uh, it was about Philippe Petit walking across the uh, Twin Towers, and actually his grandfather said to him when he was when he was doing this, he said, "Listen, if you're not walking on the wire, you're just waiting." <laughs> so I'll tell you, I'm always walking on the wire because that's what it is, right? Because look, we we have to kind of figure out. Treatment versus detoxification. So, just to let you know, the biggest organ in your body is skin. The biggest internal organ in your body is liver. You're an orthopedic surgeon. Whatever. Okay, it's fine. It's fine. So, the liver is the biggest organ in your body, and uh, unfortunately, your liver is handling stuff that it never had to handle. So, like. 50 years ago, my parents, if they were exposed to toxins, maybe we're exposed to the same amount of toxins that they had in their lifetime within about 20 minutes. 90,000 new chemicals since then. And 1,500 new chemicals per year. So what does that mean for your liver? It means your liver is working extra, extra hard. So there are naturally existing toxins. Those tend to not be so bad. It's the pesticides. It's the chemicals. It's the fumes. So wait, what do they do? You've got this good detoxifying system. It's in your liver, and it should work really well. So you got like, since this is like, you know, three tier thing, well you got three ways of detoxifying. So you got the liver, which the most common one to think of is the P450 system. So that's the most common metabolic path that you can use. That, you know, detoxifies these toxins, pharmaceutical agents, and it's pretty interesting because one would think, what does it do? Well, what it does is that most of the times these toxins are lipophilic. It means that they like fat, which isn't good because that's kind of where they stay. It's, it's, okay, I'll try. Can I, can I just do this? So, um, so the <laughs> lipids like fat. Okay, no, no, toxins like fat. Okay, so, um, so the liver, basically what it does is the first concept of detoxification is to make it water-soluble. 
That's what it does. It really tries to convert it into more water soluble. And by doing that, it really um, changes it a bit to make it so that it, it likes water more. But by doing that, it actually causes free radicals, which sounds like why would your body want to make free radicals? Well, because if you have enough antioxidants and if you have the second part of your uh, detoxifying pathway intact, it should be able to handle it. Well, the problem is, is that certain compounds, like toxicants that are man-made, specifically, let's say, the pesticides that are on your lawn, they actually induce the, the CYP pathway. They induce the P450 system, which means that it actually makes more free radicals, which is why food is so important. Because if you are generating free radicals at a very high amount, you know, you, you're playing golf, very highly pesticide lawn, it's inducing your body to metabolize, trying to get rid of those toxins. If you don't recirculate your glutathione or your sulfurans that now couple that free radical, that bad guy, and let it go to the next pathway, which is this sort of phase three, which is it goes into your bile, it goes into your urine, goes into your feces, and gets out. And you will continue to be exposed. And that's why using certain supplements, such as glutathione, N-acetylcysteine. N-acetylcysteine is the weight-limiting effect to produce glutathione. It's glycine and glutamate, which are the other two components. And as an ER doc, N-acetylcysteine is used as the antidote for the most common cause of liver failure, which is Tylenol, 7-minute overdose. And it uses the glutathione pathway. But interesting, glutathione alone does not work. Um, there are other supplements to use, the B vitamins, magnesium, those are all necessary to really activate the detoxification pathway. You can use certain chelating agents. And chelating agents are agents that kind of just grab onto stuff and absorb it and get it, get rid of your system. So some of those are chlorophyll-related supplements, lantrogen, charcoal, all these kind of supplements you want to take separate from anything you eat or any of the vitamin and minerals that you take, because they will do what they do with everything else. They'll absorb it and they'll get it out, so you won't get the nutrition. Um, we use manual therapies, lymphatic drainage, craniosacral massage, which is looking at your ability to have normal flow with your spinal fluid. Saunas. Infrared sauna uses a lower temperature heat. It's kind of like it, it heats you up more from the inside so that you sweat. Hydration, hydration, and more hydration. And physical activity. It used to be believed that people that have Lyme disease shouldn't move. I don't know who ever thought that joke was going but, but I mean, <laughs> he's retracted. Um, um, because it didn't make any sense. You move, you get the flow going, it does lots of stuff. It helps with endorphins, um, makes you feel better. So, patient enters our practice. We initially will treat them with, you know, first, like I said, we will look specifically at their gut. We'll look at all their biological terrain. And we will really look to see what is the most likely diagnosis based on symptoms and then use laboratory testing to support it. But like I said, you really have to use a multi-drug approach. Now some responses are, well, aren't you going to raise more resistance? And actually, it's the opposite. And in fact, Unfortunately, I don't know why people think that. I mean, the idea of using multiple drugs is so that resistance doesn't form because you have another drug that counteracts the resistance. 
the idea of amoxicillin and clavulanic acid is specifically for that, right? So remember, clavulanic acid is the beta lactamase. It is not that effective in terms of its ability to affect the cell wall like amoxicillin is. So it's a, it's a good two drug regimen. Um, Persistent infection is pretty important. And like I said, doxycycline and minocycline, one, like we heard, they're bacteriostatic, especially at the doses that are typically given. The problem is higher doses means higher, higher sensitivity, higher reaction. So people typically have a lot of gut problems from it. They're also told, you know, some barbaric untruth that you have to take it on an empty stomach, which is completely not true. What it is is you don't want to take it with calcium or magnesium rich foods, which is because the staple diet is we all have milk and, and stuff like that. So yeah, it's going to bind to that. But you want to take it with food. You just don't want to take it with anything that's going to interact with it. And typically it's the calcium and magnesium. So we never tell people that. Um, Plaquenil is an old anti-malarial drug. And by the way, it's given for rheumatoid arthritis. And by the way, if you look at the map, like we saw the map of the incidence and the prevalence for Lyme disease, and you take the same map of multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, Parkinson's disease, and you look at the map of the incidence and prevalence, guess what? You could superimpose them. They look the same. So, of course, the question is, what's it? Is it MS or is it Lyme disease? And unfortunately, unless we do autopsy studies on people's brains, which is typically what people don't want, uh, um, you know, we're not going to know. But again, the study out of, out of uh, Tulane with Monica Embers showing that there were active spirochete in the brain of two monkeys. So we look at different potentials of what this could be. And we're going to talk about the next slide is going to actually show some of the co-infections. But these are specifically what we look at in terms of our dosing. So we may give minocycline and doxy, and we always give at least two drugs. We typically give more. And they're always going to be on the gut protocol. And then we may offer some oils, essential oils. Very interesting work done by Dr. Zhang. And he looked at both the effectiveness of these persister drugs like daptomycin, pyrazinamide, cefalperazone, and he compared their effectiveness with some common oils that you have in, at least as herbs, in your cabinet. They would be clove, oregano, and cinnamon. They actually have the activity in a test tube, not in vitro. I mean, that's what we're trying to do is we need clinical trials. That's, that's what's going to make this work. Is that those oils seem to have equivalent effectiveness as the drugs, even at the same dosing. And in fact, oregano oil has the highest activity. So all of our patients, or most of our patients, we put on oregano oil. One, also because oregano is good for the persistent, but it's also because it really has some other anti-infective properties, uh, anti-candidal properties, because people that are on treatment tend to get overgrowth of candidiasis. So we always do that, and oftentimes I put people on a antifungal as well. Typically, it's a non-absorbing antifungal, like nystatin, since nystatin doesn't go past the gut in terms of its absorption. If you're going to use a very aggressive approach, like fluconazole or the azoles, you have to watch for liver enzyme elevation, especially when you're giving any drugs that will go through that pathway. Again, you're going to be overtaxing the CYP450 system. So this is kind of what we do. And then we say, OK, 100% better. You're good. We're good. We go by symptom improvement. There is no test, like Bob said, to say if you've got it or you don't have it. You don't have it yet. So we have to go by symptoms. 
And by going by symptoms, if you feel better, now we typically do this, we typically give you the round, and it may be three months. We look for you to have essentially an 80% improvement, and then we may continue on the same dosing for another month, and then we tend to taper the dosing. After that, and as we're tapering you down on that, we may then start to add herbal therapy to support you. Herbal therapies really more act as a, an environment that the bacteria don't like to grow. And we've seen that to be pretty effective. And you know, I know some of you are going to ask about some of the other options of treatment. We're all trying to figure it out. Hyperbaric oxygen, uh, ozone therapy, UV therapy, Rife machine. Uh, you know, people have had effectiveness with all of them and have also have not affected. All right, so if you're zero percent, like you're not getting better, then again, you gotta keep the differential diagnosis up. Did we get it wrong? If you got something else, you got a brain tumor. We have to so keep the differential diagnosis. Is it rheumatological stuff? Get rheumatological markers. Is it something else that's going on? So you just have to always consider it. And I will tell you that in our practice, we are a, a group-based practice, which means that we really appreciate and welcome the input of our nutritionists, our acupuncturists, our naturopaths, our TCM practitioners, our meditative, because there could be many other conditions. So we, we always tend to look for that. Um, we typically then do what's called a restorative phase. Again, this is where we look to detox. If it didn't work, let's see if not treating you makes you better. And I will tell you that there are some folks that we don't treat, we treat for this couple months, they're not getting better, we stop treatment, the first week they're off treatment, they go, wow, I feel like the lights turned on again. They feel significantly better. Is, okay, keep going. If by two weeks they're still feeling better, we say keep going. If by two weeks they say, you know what, my symptoms are coming back, then we think that this is likely continued <coughs> infection. So that's kind of how that goes, and again, we'll kind of keep going from this. So the problem with Lyme and tick point illnesses is it's what Bob said and a number of people have said here already. This is not just one infection. It is an immune suppressant. So if you've had Epstein-Barr virus or mono, and you had it when you were 16 and you're now 35, and you're not living in a college dorm and you feel so fatigued, can't get out of bed, and you've got lymph nodes that are swollen in your, in your throat, you may have relapsed because it's an immunosuppressant it allows stuff like that to come out. If you'd had chicken pox and now you're 25 and you got shingles, that ain't right. You gotta think that there's something immunosuppressive going on. So Drexel University, which is uh, where, you know, one of our other colleagues, uh, Garth Ehrlich, who is another fantastic researcher looking at biofilm and the potential of using some chemicals to really affect biofilm. Uh, they did a tick experiment. So they looked at hundreds of ticks. They found upwards of a hundred different microbes in each tick. So this is a problem because that's the issue is, is that it's not just Lyme disease. And the symptoms of Babesia for instance, which typically are drenching night sweats. I mean, people feel like they've got to change their shirts at night. They may have it during the day. Severe headache, not always, but if you have it, it feels like a knife pick into your head. And this really weird air hump, right? People feel short of breath, but you check their oxygen level and it's normal. 
I feel this sense of this, it's called air hunger, because I feel like, I just, I can't seem to take a, a deep enough breath. I almost feel like I'm, I can't have a good breath. And in fact, even when they're laying down, I feel that. And this could be an 18 year old who was otherwise healthy. I get this strange testicular pain as a secondary symptom, pelvic pain in females, urinary frequency. Again, you want to mis misdiagnose, have all these symptoms. You'll go to see, you know, you've got to see a urologist, a cardiologist, a neurologist, a psychiatrist, and, and that's only four. We got 50 more to go. I mean, it's, and so the problem is, is because, you know, when one of the people said, well, I treated this, and one of the docs here said that she treated someone for, you know, three months with doxycycline and not getting better. One, never treat with the same old drug. It just doesn't work. And if you're going to do a drug, um, you know, if you don't want to do a drug, do an herb. Herbs are pretty good. Um, so with Babesia, you're not going to treat them with doxycycline. It has no effect on them. So in fact, we really would treat them with an anti malaria drug. So physical exam, typically they have, like, Heat. They like this heat. Their, their head is hot. They have inflamed tissues. The back of their neck tends to be tender. Air hunger, again, like we said, that's not significant. Now, Babesia is an intracellular parasite. It affects the red blood cell. It causes destruction of the red blood cell. So you can see people with mild anemias. And interesting enough, you can see that they turn up their platelets because they think the body thinks that they're immune, they're they're anemic, so they start to turn on their it's called their RDW, which is the reticular site tank. They sometimes can get elevated creatinine level because of some effect on the kidneys. Typically, you want to make sure that is there else something going on, right? If they have severe headaches, the worst headache they ever had, and I've heard this, um, you want to make sure that they don't have anything bad going on. So again, we found with, with uh, neurological symptoms of Lyme, Babesia, uh, some of the others, craniosacral is a really effective treatment. Uh, some folks, if you give them whole body massages and they're really inflamed, whole body massages sometimes can make things worse. Lymphatic massage is different, that typically is better. But acupuncture, great for joint pain um, and also gut pain. It's just a good adjunctive treatment. Again, nutrition, nutrition, nutrition. And then antibiotics, if and when appropriate, physical activity. And then the supplements. So one of the more interesting supplements that's out there is Artemisia. So Artemisia is, um, is an herb, and it's pretty interesting because uh, the Nobel Prize for Medicine was awarded to Yu Yu Tu from China back in 2015. And she was awarded it because she developed a technique over the past 40 years of decocting uh, artemisia in the field so that people that lived in remote areas could treat their malaria without seeking health care uh, practitioners. And the service that she did, right, this is a company, she's now, I think she's in her 80s now. Um, but she developed this, and Artemisia is very effective as an anti malarial agent. And so what we do is we give Artemisia, because not only is it effective for its role in Babesia, but it actually has its effect on the persistent form of Lyme, and, and uh, can be used really well. Um, some of the other herbs, Cryptoleptis is an herb that's used out of Ghana. It's also used for malaria. I'll be honest, we haven't seen as good results with it than with Artemisia. Uh, BLT, not the sandwich, is bone set, lamation, and teasel. Typically herbs, if you're giving herbs for Lyme, it's not single therapy. Herbs work best in concert, and um, that's just kind of how they work. Um, magnesium, 
many people become magnesium deficient and your body is kind of doing all this tension if you're getting tremors or muscle spasms. Magnesium is your, magnesium is your friend unless you're passing it through your gut. And so you know if you're taking too much is if you're having loose bowel movements. The forms to take if you're constipated would be magnesium citrate and if you have loose bowel movements it's magnesium glycine. And you can go up to 500, 752,000 milligrams. Um, medical marijuana. So, pretty crazy. Uh, you've, got a, you've got a drug that is a class one drug. Class one drugs are basically thought of having no medicinal value and highly addictive. And that's, what medical, that's what marijuana is. That's it's still classed as a class one drug. Um, pretty outrageous, right? Pretty outrageous. How did this happen? You just gotta follow the money. So if you follow the money back in the 1930s, because uh, medical marijuana used to be used in medicine. It was on formula. It was in the pharmacopoeia. It was used for many, many disorders, just like it's used now today, very effectively. Anti-nausea, it's the only it's the only drug out there that is both anti-nausea and appetite stimulant. Only drug out there. Its effect on pain is remarkable. Its effect on movement disorder is remarkable. The highest concentration of THC receptors and CBD receptors are in the substantia nigra. That's the area of the brain that is Parkinson's. So why every neurologist wouldn't put their Parkinson's patient on medical marijuana? Just see if it works. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. So that young boy who was on opiates, we transferred a seven, eight-year-old to medical marijuana. He got off his opiates. So we. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna now I'm gonna now talk like I'm from the Bronx, which is so we're gonna go really really quick. No, uh, so this is typically the the treatment that we work at. So we use anti-malarial drugs for Babesia, coartum we typically pulse in a three-day dosing, malarum we typically keep, um, Yuan we typically do also pulse it three weeks on one week off. Same thing. With has persistent activity, and that's why we think it is probably a really good drug. IV artemisia, we do use IV intravenous form of artemisia, and we found very good results with it. I'm going to kind of skip right over here, because Bartonella is another important aspect of, of looking at Lyme disease. Bartonella, unfortunately, is a very tough bug. It can stay active on a table like this for eight to 12 hours. It can be, you can get Bartonella from a flea bite, from lice. And in fact, if you look at homeless people, 20% of them have active Bartonella. Cat scratch fever, which is Bartonella hensley, it may be self-limiting, but not Bartonella quintana. And in fact, if you look at the reports of how you treat Bartonella quintana, which is known as trench fever, which is, is first recognized in, in World War I, is it is a long-term treatment. Three to six months, up to four years. Bruising, neuropathy, burning tongue. I'm sorry, I heard the story that I heard. You got Bartonella. If you never were treated and you have an IgG, then you have Bartonella that's been untreated. Period, end of story. I don't care who's saying it. Look, as an ER doc, I was always an advocate. I had a woman coming, she was 35 years old, she was, she was, she was, you know, in her menses, she was fine, right? She had chest pain, shortness of breath. I said, she's got heart disease, she's got cardiac abnormality, she's got something going on. This is now 30 years ago, I'll be honest, 30 years ago. I had a cardiologist that said to me, she doesn't have heart disease, she can't have heart disease. She's got estrogen, she's good. I said, I don't care what you tell me, she's got a heart disease. And I'm going to have to tell you, if you're not going to come in, I'm going to call the chief medical officer. 
You get her cat. She was cat. She had a complete occlusion. The testing and the studies were done on men, not on women. The guidelines are misinformed at best. They have to be changed. You're here, and I will tell you that groups like Southern Tier, Focus on Lyme, Lyme Action Network, they're how you will change this. This has to change. This is ridiculous. If you're going to tell me you don't have a disease, that's not enough. Everyone can be a critic. If you're a doctor, you tell me what you got, not what you don't have. So, Bartonella is a crazy disease. Another story, 35 years old. Six weeks of electric shock treatment. Hospitalized on 10 medications. Came to see me, she was almost comatose. Tested her for Bartonella, she was positive. Treated her, guess what? Off the medications, she's fine. Now, I'm not saying everyone is like that, but I had a 12-year-old, the same thing. Imagine that. Doc's saying, I don't know, but are you guys happy? Maybe your parents aren't happy and your child is just trying to cut herself because of that. Gained 70 pounds on seven different anti-psychotic medications. It was 12 years old. When I told her she was 200 pounds, she could barely even look at me. She's now 15, great student, doing terrific. I just saw it. Just because she walked in with her dad to get some supplements or something, but it wasn't that she was sick. So, stretch marks. You got it, you got it. You got it. Yeah. Um, typically, plantar pain. Lymphadenopathy, cat exposure, dog exposure. So, same stuff. And I'll open it up to questions. This is the map. It's very confusing, but actually, if you look at it, it's not all that confusing. I don't even have time for pyrazinamide. Pyrazinamide is it's a pretty interesting drug. It's not perfect. You've seen it. It can, it can affect, it can do pretty well with Lyme disease alone, but if you've got co-infections, it's not all that it's cut out to be. Uh, but it is an interesting drug, it disrupts the cell membrane, it blocks protein synthesis, but it has no activity against growing cells. Either does daptomycin, so if you use it alone, it will not work. And, by the way, it has significant hepatotoxicity. So you have to, we always put people on milk thistle, that's one of the other detoxifying herbs, burdock root, milk thistle, dandelion root. All right, we're almost done. All right, so the gut protocol improves treatment results, it increases your immune function, it generates good bacteria. Supplementation enhances the body's natural function, it's less toxic, it's more sustainable, Use your food as medicine. Non-pharmaceutically fight against the bug, like that gentleman John. <coughs> Decrease your stress. Love your neighbor. Love your wife. Love your kids. Um, and I think that's it.